Hello everybody, and welcome to yet another one of my fantastic One Piece shill videos. In the previous chapter, there was a quote by one of the Marines that started a lot of discussion. Uh, it's basically after the conversation between Big Mom and Kaido. The Marines are under the impression that Big Mom and Kaido are thinking about teaming up, or at least, you know, coming, coming uh, to friendly terms with each other. And one of the Marines says this, and I quote, the only ones with enough power to stop them are the admirals or the warlords. And then people commented on, on my video saying that they kind of felt how it was really cool that Kizaru was just like, yo, Zakazuki, do you want me to go? Like, just very, very, like, matter of fact. Like, it's like, whatever, I can go, you know, see if I can stop them. I don't know. So people are like, wow. Like, he, he must be pretty confident about, like, being able to stop two Yonko from meeting, or at least wreaking havoc uh, in Wano, right? Now, here's the thing. Like, at first, I didn't understand why people were getting the impression that Big Mom was going to Wano, because, like, in the chapter, like, Kaido clearly tells her, if you, if you come in here, if I see you here, I'm gonna kill you. I feel like even though they don't say this, I think there's a sense of respect an unspoken sense of respect be between Big Mom and Kaido, so I'm still not 100% sold on the idea of Big Mom going uh, into Wano, actually entering the country of Wano, crossing the border, if you will, especially because back in Hulk Cake, like, she told Luffy, like, there's no way you're going to defeat that thing. So again, there's, there's some unspoken sense of respect between the two, and I feel like it's enough for them to sort of like agree to stay out of each other's way. So right now I kind of feel like if she goes, she'll probably like stay in the outskirts, you know, outside the perimeter of Wano. And that's if she decides to go at all, because I feel like there's a body of evidence pointing towards Big Mom's story concluding in Elbaf. And these are just some examples for us to why I think that. So Elbaf is obviously hiding something. There's a source of power related to the Elbaf giants, or just related to Elbaf, that Big Mom knows what it is, uh, that hasn't been revealed yet in the story. Another thing is, during Big Mom's flashback, after she eats her friends, the orphans, and Mother Carmel, there's only two witnesses to that atrocious event. The first witness is Strusen, who decides to stick around and sort of like guide Big Mom and also kind of like take care of her, but at the same time, like, you know, he, he's kind of doing it to manipulate her in a way, at least in the beginning. He takes advantage of her enormous strength so that he can profit off of that. And then the second one is a giant from Elbaf, and he runs away, and he tells the giants what happened, the fact that Big Mom ate the, the kids, the orphans, and Mother Carmel. Why would Oda have that giant there if he's not going to do anything with it? Like, later on. Like, I think that the reason for why the giant is there in the story is so that Big Mom can eventually learn what she did to, to the orphans and to Mother Carmel. Because even now, in her old age, she has no idea what she ended up doing when she was eating the Semla. She has no idea that she actually ate those people that she cared about. So I think that, that has to come into play at some point in the future of her story. And right now, the only people who know the truth is Strusin, who I'm guessing has decided not to reveal what happened to her, and the giants. And the giants are in Elbaf. Going back to 907, the Marines interpret the fact that the call between Kaido and Big Mom is open as a sign of overconfidence or confidence from the Yonko's part. So the call is not being secured. Anybody can hack into it. Uh, the two Yonko didn't really care about the privacy of the call, and, and the Marines interpret this as an invitation. But I also think that if the Marines can actually hack into this call and are listening in on it, that also means, at least to me, it can imply that Blackbeard also has access to this call and is probably also listening to the same thing. And if he is listening to the same thing, he's probably going to use that information uh, to his favor, take advantage of it, in order to cook up a scheme. So the Yonko don't care about the Marines getting involved. They're like, it's not a big deal. Just just let them listen to this. But then Kizaru also makes it seem as if it's not a big deal to go to Wano and try and stop, you know, the chaos from erupting. Or at least keep it under control. So both sides seem pretty confident. And so what that does is that fortunately or unfortunately, it gets people thinking about, okay, how, how would an admiral fare up against a Yonko? Or in other words... Uh, how strong is an admiral in comparison to a Yonko? How powerful is an admiral 
by themselves. What is Admiral Level? This is one of the most discussed, debated questions in the One Piece fandom when it comes to the power structure of the show. So I'm going to try and explain it the best I can using evidence from the series, okay, from the manga, but I also want you guys to be aware that at the end of the day, we all have our biases, we're all human, and so it doesn't matter what I say, at the end of the day, people are either going to choose to lean towards the Yonko or lean towards the Admirals. And the first thing we need to do here, believe it or not, is look at Luffy. Uh, we have to agree on where to place Luffy. We have to scale Luffy first uh, or, or come to some sort of consensus. It will all make sense by the end, I promise, okay? So we look at the Luffy versus Katakuri fight and we find that from a storytelling aspect, it's a win in favor of Luffy. However, from a feat standpoint, you could argue that the fight is closer to a draw than anything else. This actually brings me to the first major point of this video, which is that if you look at the power structure, the power scaling in the series of One Piece, the power scaling of this series is pretty reliable and accurate so long as it doesn't interfere with Luffy's journey. Another way of saying it is that the pre-established level of power in the series of One Piece is pretty solid, okay, so long as it does not go against or interfere with Oda's plan for Luffy. Because if it goes against what Oda wants Luffy to do in the story, that's when the power structure begins to get a little bit wobbly. But anyway, thanks to the Katakuri fight, I think we can pretty much all agree that Luffy, as of right now, is around Yonko Commander level. And not just any Yonko Commander, but he's around the first Yonko Commander's level. Like, you know, the, the right-hand man of a Yonko. Because Katakuri was first in line after Big Mom. So we're talking about Luffy being around that same level. So he's kind of flirting, or he's already at the level that we attribute to characters such as Marco. Because remember, Marco was the first division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates. So again, at the very least, um, he's, he's in that vicinity. Luffy is around that level. Uh, and Max, he's already achieved that level. Um, so that's, that's the range that he's in right now. So if we agree that Luffy is around the same level as a first Yonko commander right now, then we can move on to the next point which is this. If we look at Marineford, okay, there is an abundance amount of evidence to showcase that a first Yonko commander is capable of momentarily stalling an admiral and momentarily pushing them back. Notice that I'm saying momentarily. So I'm going to give you four examples of this happening, just so you know I'm not BSing. The first one is when Marco lands a kick on Kizaru, He's like, yo, you can't take the king on the first turn. Sorry, bud. Uh, Kizaru kind of makes a quip. He makes a joke. Marco pushes on that kick, and he sends Kizaru flying into the concrete pretty far away. Uh, and there's an explosion. But then after that, Kizaru just returns back to normal fairly, fairly soon afterwards. Number two is when Aokiji is stabbing Luffy with one of his icicles. Marco once again comes in with a kick and sends Aokiji flying pretty far away. But then Aokiji comes back fairly soon after that as well. So again, momentarily pushing them back. In terms of stalling, we have Ben Beckman being able to hold Kizaru at gunpoint. Again, this is all momentarily because after this scene, we kind of we kind of cut away from it and then Kizaru goes back to doing his thing. So it's just momentarily stalling here, another great example. And then finally, we have this scene here of Marco being able to momentarily stall Akainu from getting to Jinbei and Luffy. So he does kind of hold them there for a moment. And so if you follow this logic and agree that Luffy right now is first Yonko commander level, then that pretty much means that Luffy at this point in time should be able to push back an admiral momentarily and stall them momentarily. And so right now I'm guessing some of you are wondering, wait a minute, Sawyer, didn't we already know that Luffy could push back an admiral like back in Dress Rosa when he pushed back Fujitora? Um, well, well, no, not exactly because Back in Dress Rosa, Oda gave Fujitora a handicap. When Luffy was clashing with him, Fujitora was using part of his power to levitate and keep up a crap ton, and I mean a crap ton of rubble. So I really don't think that it's worth counting that feat 
towards Luffy because at the time, Fujitora was lifting buildings worth of wreckage. Uh, if, if he had not been doing that, I'm pretty sure it would have been a different story. During the last reverie that I participated in, my good friend Ty asked me who I thought would win in a fight between Marco and Jack. And at the time, the first answer that came to mind was, I want to die. But I guess it would just depend on whether or not Jack is Kaido's right-hand man. Because as of right now, we have no official confirmation of Jack being like the first uh, top-tier calamity under Kaido. And so if there is somebody above Jack, I feel like Marco should be able to handle Jack. Another point that I want to make about the Admirals pertains to their hockey. Now we know that Marines that have the rank of Vice Admiral and above all have hockey. We know that for a fact. And when it pertains to the Admirals, who are of a higher rank, there's some hints, there's some evidence to suggest that they may be able to use future site observation hockey. For one, the way that Fujitora is able to see the silhouettes of people around him is very similar to the way that Luffy was able to see Katakuri silhouette during his fight when he was uh, awakening future sight. So just the shape of those silhouettes is very, very, very similar. But even above that, there's a scene in Marineford where Whitebeard tries to stab Aokiji with his spear using hockey, and Aokiji uh, actually opens up a hole to let the spear pass right through him, which, if you remember, is actually the same technique that Katakuri uses against Luffy when he's predicting where Luffy's punches are going to land so that he doesn't take any damage. So in both Aokiji and Katakuri's case, the character needs to use Future Sight in order to predict where the blow is going to land so that they can open up a hole and let the attack just pass right through them. We also know that in Punk Hazard, Aokiji fought Akainu for the title of Fleet Admiral and he eventually lost. They fought for 10 days and eventually Aokiji lost and so if Aokiji does in fact have Future Sight, then that pretty much guarantees that Akainu either has Future Sight as well, or he has something that allowed him to bypass Aokiji's Future Sight ability during their 10-day battle in Punk Hazard. And speaking of Akainu, a lot of people go to the fight with Whitebeard at Marineford to try and figure out who would win between a Yonko and an Admiral. I mean, just look at Akainu's face in this scene. It's like, what have I done? The problem with that, though, is that that fight is kind of an anomaly, and I'm going to tell you why. So, first and foremost, Whitebeard was not only not at his prime during that fight, but at the same time, he was sick. He was sick. At one point, he has a conversation with Marco before they even arrive at Marineford and tells him, you think I'm going to show up with all this medical stuff and have them pity me? And he just rips off his IV, all this medical gear. He's like, no, no, I'm going to show up without any of this. So he goes in there, and at one point, there's this moment where he coughs up blood, and Akainu is able to land a punch on him. After Akainu kills Ace, Whitebeard just starts going crazy. But even then, like, look at, look at what Akainu does to Whitebeard's face. Not only that, but he also takes some of Whitebeard's hits. Whitebeard ends up cracking the floor of Marineford, and so Sakazuki Akainu falls, but then he's, he's back up afterward. He, he comes back up to chase Luffy. So he takes that damage and he comes back up to pursue Luffy once again. Again, Whitebeard not at his prime and Whitebeard being sick. However, when it comes to Akainu's side, okay, Akainu was playing defense, all right? It's very clear. It's, it's stated in both the anime and the manga that he's trying to protect Marine Ford from getting destroyed. He actually tells Whitebeard, if I let you do whatever you want to do here, this island is going to get destroyed. I have to protect this. That's his job, right? And we know from his fight with Aokiji that when Akainu gets serious, like he could literally change the weather of an island permanently. But because he's at Marine Ford, he's probably trying to be a little bit more conservative with his power, you know, he's not going to go crazy for fear of damaging the structure that he's trying to protect. But then, of course, that intent doesn't end up mattering at all because Whitebeard just cracks it wide open, brings it down. So because of the factors that I mentioned, it's kind of difficult to use that fight to come up with an accurate conclusion one way or the other. However, we do know for a fact, okay, this is a fact, it's example flight throughout the story where Aokiji freezes Whitebeard Tsunami or he freezes part of the ocean and freezes a sea king alive. Or when Akainu and Aokiji simultaneously change the weather of an island permanently. Or when Fujitora is lifting up a city worth of rubble, buildings upon buildings of stuff that he's just levitating up in the air. Okay, 
that pretty much tells us that admirals have island level capacity. That's one of the things that we can say with absolute confidence is that admirals have island level capacity and range. And so how does this stack up against the Yonko? Well, we're gonna find this out very soon. I'm just gonna tell you what you're gonna look for in order to find out the answer. So we saw back in Whole Cake that Luffy used Gear Fourth against Big Mom, and she was able to deal with that immediately. Like she pushed him out of Gear Fourth almost instantly. Okay. Now the anime may stretch things out and it may make you believe things that were not in the manga, but that it doesn't matter what the anime does. The manga is there. You can look at it. Luffy goes Gear Fourth. Boom. He's pretty much out the moment the hit lands because Big Mom just like does something to him, and he's deflating instantly. So Luffy at that point was not able to push Big Mom back and he was also not able to stall her at all. However, at this point in time, Luffy is also not top Yonko Commander level. He's not first Yonko Commander level in this scene because his fight against Katakuri hasn't happened yet. And then you have this whole flashback scene with Rayleigh of him saying that hockey blossoms when you get into very intense situations and fights, which is exactly what Luffy got out of the Katakuri fight because he did grow from that fight, and that left him at first Yonko Commander level. Not before, though. But then you could also go and say, wait a minute, didn't Capone stall Big Mom momentarily when he was in his fortress form? And while that's true, you know, Capone did go Big Father, and he did protect the Straw Hats momentarily, but I think it's important to remember a couple of things. First of all, the anime did a horrible job at adapting this scene, because in the anime, Capone takes a bunch of hits from Big Mom. Just a ton of it. Like, the entire episode is Big Mom going, Get the coin, Beggie! Beige is like, ah, ah, but he just takes so many hits, so it's, it's just misleading, it's a lie, don't believe the anime. A lot of it just has to do with them having to stretch out scenes you know, to, to make a full episode out of stuff. But the way they do it is just is super, super misleading. And look, the fact of the matter is this. It's heavily implied in the series that Capone's highest stat is his defense, okay? And it seems like his double fruit ability is geared towards amplifying that stat, okay? So he has, he has pretty broken defense, okay? So I'm just gonna tell you straight up what happens in the manga and then you can draw your own conclusions based off of that. Number one, Big Mom does not use armament hockey to attack the fortress. No hockey is used when she attacks Capone's fortress form. Number two, okay, she is not using her devil fruit ability to attack Capone in this scene. And then finally, number three, in the manga, Big Mom never hits Capone twice in the same spot when he's in this castle form. To conclude, and in my opinion, there are a couple of things that can take place in the manga very soon that will allow people to finally settle this debate once and for all and understand how an admiral stacks up against a Yonko. Two of them are very clear cut, super easy to interpret, not a whole lot of analysis needed. The first one is if Shanks fights an admiral at Reverie, okay? If he starts clashing with somebody like Green Bull or Fujitora, we'll get an answer to that question. The second one is if Kizaru goes to Wano and ends up clashing with either Kaido or Big Mom at some point. And then the third and final way of finally figuring this out is by looking at a character who is first Yonko Commander level, top Yonko Commander level, such as somebody like Marco, Katakuri, Shiryu, Luffy, and seeing how they clash against a Yonko. If any of these characters, these top Yonko Commander fighters go up against a Yonko and they are capable of either stalling them momentarily or pushing them back momentarily, okay, we know where they're at now because of the stuff that I said about the admirals in the beginning portion of this video. If they do less than stall them out momentarily and push them back momentarily, we also get an answer, okay? And if they do more, okay, we get an answer as well. Hopefully, if they do fight against a Yonko, I hope it's Kaido, just because Kaido is the, the prime example of, of what a Yonko is in terms of strength, combat-wise, physically, okay? Uh, I'm only saying this because in the Ace novel, Kaido seemed to be comparable with Whitebeard, okay? Whereas Big Mom was not mentioned. So I think it would be a great thing for it to be Kaido uh, instead of any other Yonko, but we'll see what happens. Thank you so much for watching. Catch you guys later. I hope I gave you some insight in terms of why it's so difficult to come up with a clear-cut answer 
about what Admiral level is and how it stacks up against a Yonko. If you appreciated some of the points I made, you already know what to do. Thanks a bunch again. Catch you later. Bye.